Hi, this is Charles Kim with Tap Into South Brunswick and Cranberry. We're here today, we're actually in Princeton on Bun Drive for the opening of the 16th legislative race, Democrats office, Andrew Zw Zwicker, uh, South Brunswick native, is an assemblyman, is running for re-election in his first re-election. Uh, he beat Donna Simon by 78 votes last time around. Simon is running again this year, so we're gonna see how that rematch plays up as the Democrats hope to gain two seats, the two, actually two or three seats, uh, they have one. And the Republicans have the state Senate in Kip Bateman. Uh, former Assemblyman Jack Cittarelli is, had to give up his seat this year because he ran for governor. And he lost in the Republican primary to Kim Godagno, who will face off against Democrat Phil Murphy in the gubernatorial race this year. So that pretty much brings you up to speed. We're gonna have speeches, of course, from the three legislative Democratic legislative candidates uh, coming up as we bring this to you as the Democrats kick off the 2017 election season. another senator and it's all because folks like you came out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon to get this thing kicked off. My name is Craig Coughlin. I have the great privilege of representing the 19th legislative district which consists of Woodbridge and Cerebral. Thanks Dad. Uh, 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 Woodbridge, Cerebral, South Amway, Perth Amboy and Carteret. And uh, I wanted to come down to be here with Lori and with Roy and with my friend Andrew uh, to kick off their campaign because this is really going to be something fun to watch and more importantly it's going to be a real bellwether and it's going to tell us how just how good we are doing as Democrats, right? Now we've got, we've got terrific candidates and we, we start you know, with, with Andrew, whom I've had the great privilege of working with over the last couple of years, uh, he is, you know, it's an overused term, but he is truly a rising star in the Democratic Party, and we're fortunate to have him on our side. He's going to make a big difference. Yeah, give, let's give Andrew a big round of applause. And Roy is someone I've had a chance to have a couple of meetings with. I can tell you he's as hardworking and as dedicated and as thoughtful as you could want in an assembly candidate. He's going to make a great assemblyman. Roy, congratulations for being on the ticket. And Lori, I haven't gotten to know you very much because there's, a, you know, the Senate's a little snooty. They're a little snooty. Uh, but she's going to be a terrific senator and it's going to make a real difference. And, it, you know, it really matters that we get things rolling in the right direction, right? It, it, it's an important statement that we're going to make relative to Washington. It's an important statement to say that, you know, Democrats understand what matters and we're going to bring good Democratic values. We're going to have a new Democratic governor. Let's hear it for Phil Murphy, who's going to change what has just been an abominable eight years under the, well, it's hard to call it leadership, under the direction, I guess, of of Chris Christie. So you are fortunate to have such terrific candidates. They're fortunate to have you. I'm lucky that I got to spend a couple of minutes with you. Have a great time, everybody. Thanks for letting me have a couple minutes of your time. Have a good day. This is so, such a wonderful thing to see is to look out and see so many people here as we kick off the LD16 campaign. I need to acknowledge some people first before um, we get to a few other things. There are so many elected officials here. I hope I don't miss anyone, but we have uh, Mayor Brad Cohen of East Brunswick is here. Uh, he was here before. Freeholder Charlie Tomorrow is here somewhere. Charlie, are you still here? There you are. Uh, Assemblyman Craig Coughlin, thank you so much. Uh, Middlesex County Chairman Kevin McCabe is here uh, somewhere. Where he left. Uh, Freeholder Kenny Armwood is here. Hey, Kenny, raise your hand. Uh, out of Somerset, Steve Peter, I saw you a moment ago. Where are you, Councilman? There he is in the back over there. Uh, Somerset Council, Dennis Sullivan is here. I know I talked to you a moment ago. Where is he? There he is in the back. Uh, Somerset County Chairwoman Peg Schaefer is here. There she is. Out of Mercer County, uh, I know he just left. Mercer County Executive Brian Hughes was here. Let's give him a round of applause. From Princeton Councilman Tim Quinn. There he is. 
Uh, Prince of Democrat Chair Scotia McRae was here. I think she had to leave. Let's give her a round of applause. The Hunterdon County uh, Vice Chairman for the Democratic Party, Alan Harwick, was he, is he here? I see him on my list. There he is, Alan, in the back. Who am I not acknowledging? Oh my goodness. Shots is right here from Freeholder, right over here. Thank you from Somerset County. You pointed out Kenny. Middlesex. Middlesex County. You pointed out Kenny. I didn't even notice who it was. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Anybody else I forget? The, the other thank you goes to every single person that is here today. I cannot thank you enough. And in a moment, we'll bring up Roy and Lori. Um, just want to say a couple of things. Two years ago, we got together, so many of the people that are here right now, to try to do something that everyone told us was impossible. And that was to go ahead and turn the 16th legislative district from pure red to a little bit purple. And two years ago, we ran what was the largest grassroots campaign in the entire state. We ran a stealth campaign and ended up making, for the first time ever, the first Democrat in the 16th legislative history, we won by 100 votes. And this year, and this year, we have a remarkable, remarkable opportunity. Remarkable. So, when I was coming over here, I was talking to someone about what happened in Georgia, right, with the special election. And they were sort of feeling like that things were not going well. We had four special elections, and four times the Republicans won. And I said to them that I feel exactly the opposite, that I feel incredibly optimistic, because what we know is about to happen this November, the eyes of the entire country are on Virginia and they're on New Jersey. And within New Jersey, the eyes of New Jersey are on the 16th legislative district. Because if we are successful in not only bringing me back, but bringing Roy into the assembly and Lori into the Senate, we know that all of the work that we're doing, that we head towards the 2018 election, and taking back the House and stopping this president once and for all, it has to start in November of this year, and it starts with you. We have got to have the largest grassroots door knocking, phone knocking, everything we can do to get out the vote. If we do it together, I win, he wins, she wins, and the entire country is on notice, all right? And we win, we win. And if it happens for us, it's gonna happen in Hillsborough. It's gonna happen in Somerville. There. <laughs> it's going to happen throughout the 16th, up and down the ballot. We have that power, right? In June, we saw Democratic folks came out that it's working at the primary. We saw Republicans were discouraged. We are set up if we are willing to work and if we're willing to do it together. So when we come here like this right now, it really gives me just a sense of optimism. So I cannot thank you enough. And with that, I want to introduce my teammate on the assembly side, because we are going to turn the assembly and the Senate blue, and it starts on the assembly side with Roy Freiman. So come on up, Roy. This is so impressive. I, this is, I, I want to echo a lot of what Andrew has to say without repeating it. And first of all, I, I, I want to acknowledge Andrew's sandals. That, that is, uh, <laughs> I, 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 that, that, his wardrobe, can we just say, uh, an applause just for those alone. I'll wear them tomorrow. Okay. I'd like to see you wear those on the floor. I, I am used to having, you know, many of you know, first of all, that I don't come from political background. But I am used to having people come together for a common cause, as you all ha are here for a common cause. The difference is, in my background, we typically pay people to show up uh, for a common cause. And you all are doing this because you're volunteering to be here. And that's what's so impressive. So this, from my perspective, is a thank you, but a forward-looking thank you. A thank you to the volunteers that are here that helped put this on today and the volunteers and all the people that are going to be 
helping on this common cause and because we share a vision. We share a vision of something that we want that's going to be so much better. So from my perspective and, and from Andrew's and Lori's, I just want to say thank you looking forward because we're going to be very, very successful. We're going to make this happen. The primary was unbelievably successful. The numbers show it. For the first time ever, it, the, the turnout was, was, was uh, well, to quote somebody, they were huge. <laughs> and I'm going to be repeating that for the next several months, saying thank you. It, this is humbling. And, and with that, I want to introduce the next senator from the I sixth. Thing. I just want to say one thing for you. The next senator, before, okay, you, well then, I was about to introduce the next senator, so feel free. Let me just do one thing. Go ahead. Before we introduce the, the next senator from the 16th district, there are some other people that I really want to introduce from our campaign side, because we're, everyone's talked about we have such a beautiful campaign headquarters. So there's three people that I really want to make sure everybody here meets. The first one in the back, raise your hand, Kyle. Kyle is our finance director who's doing a great job of making sure we have the resources that we need to run this campaign. If you haven't met her yet, she just came on Monday, our field director, Ann Semler. Ann, can you raise your hand? Ann has maybe the toughest job, and that is organizing all of you. And so I promised her that you won't be unruly, and that you will work tirelessly daily, day and night until your knuckles are bleeding from knocking on doors. I hope you can do that for me. And where is Austin? <laughs> and our campaign manager, who is the person that has to keep everything together, Austin Lyle, who's right there. And then for me, I just have to thank one more person, the person who is my utter and complete rock my brains, my brawn, and who helped set all this up, and that's my wife, Barbara. If I didn't do that, I wasn't going home tonight. <laughs> and with that, you know, people say you can't do the impossible. I don't believe that. I think my win two years ago was an example of that we can do the impossible, and I think we are set up to do the impossible with really just an amazing person, an amazing candidate. It is my pleasure to introduce you now to the next senator from the 16th Legislative District, Lori Poppy. You. You're very tall. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out today. The support, I can't tell you how much it means. Um, the volunteers, the people who put in the time and the effort, what I'm really heartened to see is not just the crowd of us and the us coming together to do a cause, but I'm really heartened to see the wide range of ages. And there's a big push to get people in, into government under 50. There's a lot of interest here. Um, if nothing else, if President Trump has given us nothing else, he's at least reinvigorated our belief in our causes. And we are coming out in, in large, large numbers. And that because of that, we can make a difference in New Jersey this year in this election with our 16th district. Um, our primary showed strong numbers, and if we, get, if we can get the vote out, and with all of your help and all of your support, we can certainly do this. This is a winnable thing, so thank you all. With that, there's plenty of hamburgers, hot dogs, veggie burgers, uh, everything else. Thank you so much, and uh, let's get to work. Today starts the first day. Austin, how many days do we have left to Election Day? 133. 133 days left to outwork, outperform, outdoor knock, out everything our opponents. So thank you. It starts right here. Thank you so very much. So, Andrew, uh, now you're running as an incumbent. Uh, you, you were coming on as a challenger and really changed a lot here in New Jersey with the political dynamics here in the 16th. What do you see here going forward and what is it like now to be coming from as the incumbent assembly person? Right. 
so, so I mean, what I see is that number one, the approach that I've taken in my first roughly 18 months in office, I think has resonated across the entire 16th district. Um, across the entire 16th district. I try to take my scientific background and apply it no matter what we're working on and make sure that we're doing an evidence-based decision-making process. And I am getting an enormous amount of support from Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated voters. So that's very encouraging to see because I am convinced that no matter what your political affiliation, that most people are just tired of the enormous partisanship. And I do believe that a scientific approach uh, and a data-driven approach is a way to break down that divide. So that's number one. Number two, so we ca I came at it the first time right. as a challenger, and now that I'm an incumbent, it means that in the end I can go ahead and say, look, here's my record, here's what I've done, here's what I've tried to do, right? I've got a lot of work left to do, but I am proud of what I've done so far. I think that there's an enormous opportunity moving forward. And I hope to both be challenged by my opponents on my record and to have a real data-driven, issues-based campaign, because that's what the people of the city deserve to have. And you're going up against Donna Simon again. Last time, 78 votes separated right. you. Right. Um, but you also showed by working with Jack Fidel that you were able to work as a split ticket. Yep. In the assembly. Yep. With the name recognition, I mean, if I, if I were to make a guess, yeah. I would say probably that may be the way this, this election is I know you're hoping for a sweep right. on some of that but conventional wisdom about the head. Right. The rest of the news media is wrong about everything because I can do I can sure. the same thing. Right. Would say that you and Donna are pretty good probability that, that may be the ticket that comes out. What would you say if that's the case working for the next two years with that kind of? I would scenario? hope that I have an amazingly positive and excellent relationship with Jack Chiro. It has been a pleasure to work with him because while we have not agreed on every topic, we've always agreed on the process of how to get there. And in my opinion, that if that's how the political, working with someone like Jack is how the political process should work. We may have different political perspectives, but we try to find that middle ground. And I look to do that with every member of the assembly, regardless of their party affiliation. And so it doesn't matter to me whether this person, whether I'm working with Democrats or Republicans. I can't tell you what's going to happen in November. Of course, I hope that we have a, a Democratic sweep. But I will always work with all of my colleagues, regardless of party affiliation, as long as we're working with the same common set of facts that are not about politics, and then we can debate public policy. What else would you like the voters to know about today and the, the campaign going forward? What, what should we see between now and election day in November? We're going to, look, I mean, this is about issues. We are, the, you look around, there's so many people here and this is the tip of the iceberg. We're going to go out every single day, knock on doors, make phone calls, listen to the people of the 16th district. What are the issues, whether it's around affordability, the cost of college, taxes, roads, bridges, the environment, whatever it might be. Um, and we're going to run an issue space and from there we're going to hope and see that in the end the voters uh, decide that this is what they want and I get reelected. Uh, but it's up to the voters and I'm going to make my case between now and November. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, so Roy, you're running for what, the assembly seat? Yeah, state assembly, yes, in the 16th district. And you're actually... Um, the other incumbent, Jack Cinderella, left to run for governor, creating yes. a totally open seat now. Yes. And you're going to be competing for How do you feel about that? Is this your first experience in politics? Understanding you're an outsider. What got you, what made you want to get to be part of this? The, the, so I am an outsider. I haven't run for office since I was in college. I have long hair and a great looking beard at the time. And so I started reaching out and started this has been in the back of my mind for quite some time. The process actually started about a year ago when I sent Andrew Swicker an email. Didn't know him, don't, didn't know Andrew at all, and I sent him a cold email uh, because I wanted to learn about how he had gotten started. Because I knew that 
he, this was his first one and first office that he had held. And that he transitioned from you know, having a job to, you know, from, from being an elected official. And I wanted to learn about his story and how he did that. So I sent him an email out of the blue. And it started a dialogue. And he responded. And I had a chance to meet with him and we started a conversation. And I expressed an interest in that I was growing more and more disappointed with the way government was operating. What, what about a disappointment? Well, from my, my wife is a teacher in Hillsborough, so, so it starts with the governor. I just have been so disappointed with the leadership of the governor. Um, and that's primarily been the lightning rod um, uh, in New Jersey, uh, just the, the lack of leadership. It, it's just been a, a poor decision making, just the way in which he interacts with people, the way he disrespects and has been disrespectful for different opinions. I, I respect and I think it's really good to get different ideas. I think that's really important to surround yourself with the way the same people work all the time. It's not helpful. I think you do need different ideas. But you need to welcome them. You need to embrace them, I do. And when the governor constantly tells people to shut up and sit down, that's not really helpful for inviting people to join in with the conversation. And the way in which, and because my wife is a teacher, and the way he's attacked the education system, I just thought it was just absurd. And, and then just in general, the politics over a number of years has been becoming more and more polarized. For people that may not see them on the extreme, there's no place. And, and I don't see myself on the extreme. And I wanted to do something about that. And I do believe that, that the answer to a lot of the problems are often in the mirror. And it's been my place of saying, look, you know, you stop complaining and do something about it. And that's what got me involved. And you're a businessman. What kind of business are you in? So I was with Prudential for 25 years. So I held various different roles. Um, the last role that I had with Prudential was strategy and analytics um, for Prudential New York. And what do you see are the biggest challenges facing the state um, should you get elected for the next two years, and how do you feel you will address those? The state, it's, it, the economics are probably the biggest in the state. There are always competing, you always have a laundry list of too many priorities, too many competing priorities for the state budget. Um, there are a lot of really good things that we need to do and not enough money to go around. So the question is, how do you get that done? How do you bring, and you can't, and I'm not a believer in let's tax our way out of it. I do think that you can get a lot more done with our existing dollars. So I would, so I, from business, you always, things happen in business all the time. Anyone who's been in business understands that you plan, you set a budget, and then guess what? The competition reacted that you never expected and the marketplace reacted and you have to adjust for it. So I think that the state can do a lot better and we as, as, as legislatures can do a lot better getting a lot more throughput out of what is existing. $35 billion is a lot of money. We could probably do better with it, meeting the needs. But we also have to bring business into the state. You have to attract business a lot better. We've done a lousy job selling the benefits and of what New Jersey brings. We have an incredible, diverse, um, and well-educated because we've had an incredibly strong education system for decades in New Jersey. The number one thing that businesses want is power. I was with the Somerset County Partnership Association uh, Alliance. They have been incredibly successful in bringing businesses into Somerset County because they've been selling the quality of the talent in Somerset County. So that's what this is more personal for us. New Jersey will never be able to wave a wand and be the cheapest provider. Come to New Jersey because it's a cheap place to set up business. It's never going to happen. But businesses want to happen. That's what we have here. And we need to do a good job promoting that to bring that here. Because that's, that's really what's going to get us what all the things that we want so we can do the infrastructure build, which is another priority we have to do. We've got to fix our rail system, we have to fix our roads. Um, and these are the things we need and we have to make the state has got to be affordable. Um, and we have to keep an eye on that. I was saying I was saying to um Pop in this area of the state, 
most people pay between 50 and 60 percent of their income, according to a Harvard 2017 housing study. Most renters pay between 50 and 60 percent of their income just to keep a roof over their head. Instead, they prefer 25 to 30 percent. What could you do in the walls in some way to try to ease that situation while balancing what the courts are trying to do with imposing um, affordable housing units on towns, which some towns say could threaten their very existence, like in Cranberry or South Brunswick, where you could see a, a doubling or a tripling of the population? It, it is a very real scenario of imposing when the courts say, look, you've got to add all these units. So, realistically, how is it, how is this town supposed to absorb all of those, that extra inventory? All right? So that's a, that's a legitimate concern. There have got to be creative solutions, and there are creative solutions to these issues. Because affordable housing, we have to be welcoming. We can't price out communities um, to, to just pay for the bathrooms. It's wrong. So there are inventories, there are, you know, I've sat down and I've had conversations with people who say, well, what about um, the homes that maybe are, are foreclosed or abandoned? Can they be retrofitted and meet the needs of affordable housing and owned by the town? And not, so these are existing inventory retrofitted as a potential solution, rather than creating new inventories. To, to, and to, and, and I, I don't think that weaving one that's going to solve the problem. The idea of taking a step back, sitting down, and saying, all right, how do we solve this together? It, because you're right, you can't dump, you can't add this massive inventory. It's going to crush towns. But you also can't ignore it and say, sorry, we can't do anything about it. I know, it's, it's being this district two years ago. Race very close uh, between <laughs> Andrew close. and Donna Simon, 78 votes. Uh, your community situation, Donna's well known, Andrew's well known. If, if I were to be a betting man just on probability, I would say it's probably likely Kip will stay where he is and that uh, Donna, and, and, uh, Donna and, and Andrew would split the district. What are you hoping, because you and, and also the, the assembly candidate on the other side, aren't very well known. How do you intend on breaking that barrier between now and election day to really make sure people know who you are to give you a real fighting chance for that second, for that open seat? It's going to be a ton of a lot of little things. Um, to be successful, you have to do a lot of things. So you're right. I, because I'm not a professional politician, I'm not known right now. But we're, we're, we're in the month of June. The election is... 33 days away. So, um, and today before the event, I was door knocking. And it's going to continue for 133 days along with meeting with people and talking to people and getting my name out. It's going to be slow every single day working on it and, and getting my name out. And, but, it's all, but it's more than just name recognition. It's getting people to understand what I stand for and who I am. Because there's one thing of saying, all right, they know me, but how do they feel about what I stand for and will I represent what they want represented? So, you know, you can have a name, but what does it stand for? So, so you have to work on both. One is who are you, but also what will you stand for when you do it at the same time. So it's, it's a lot of little things that's going to take it to win. It's not going to be an easy race. I know that going in there, but that's okay. I enjoy the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have kind of the toughest job in these two candidates. Andrew's running as an incumbent, mm -hmm. and we have the other legislative seat open, but you're running against the long term incumbent, right. and Kip Baker. Sure. Um, very popular yep. in this district. Yep. What are you hoping to bring to this election cycle? So, I am a therapist, a collaborative law attorney, and a single mom. And my skill set is that I help people who are divorcing and in crisis um, come to mutual goals, values, and interests and reach, reach decisions that are in the best interest of their family and not selfish goals. And I think my skill set is working across the aisle to do the same thing with our first citizens of New Jersey 
because it's it, we all have common goals, values, and interests. We do as citizens. None of us want to pay higher property taxes. We want quality education for our children. We want um, we want quality and affordable health care. We want to be able to retire and stay in the state. We want to keep our schools great, but we want our kids to be able to come live here and afford afford to live here. So we want to grow our economy, um, and that's my skill set. That's what I do. Now, in, in your profession, if you were to look at New Jersey as a couple or as a person, would you as say... As a divorcing couple? As a divorcing couple. <laughs> Sometimes I do look at New Jersey as a divorcing well, couple. Well, you know, with the Assembly, Republicans, Democrats, and the Senate and all. Right. But if you were to look at it in, in those terms, based on your profession, first of all, would you say that New Jersey is in a crisis or is supposed to be stable? And if so, what areas can the state look at going forward, whether you're particularly elected or not? What do you think the state needs to do to stabilize itself? Do you think there's a problem? Sure, so some of the things that I think... Well, first of all, do you think there's... What, would New Jersey be considered like a couple or a person in crisis really on that? Do I think that New Jersey would be a divorcing couple? I mean, I think the idea is New Jersey divorcing, no, but I do believe that our, our representatives are kind of mired in partisan politics. They're busy trying to win their argument. So they're looking at their feet at what's in front of them and what's important to them instead of looking at the citizens what are our common goals and values and interests. So how do we grow the economy? How do we answer this? Um, the first thing we have to do is identify our common goals. And then we have to put into effect, well, what can we do and how. So for example, um, what I've been seeing, I've been here since 1989, is, our, is we're kicking the can down the road and we're doing a pee and shell game with budget dollars, right? So we're taking from here to move over here, but we're not resolving anything. And that, that's been going on for you. Back to Whitman before the team. Right. And... So we're growing a bigger problem. I think, and unfortunately, um, we're putting that at the cost of our children, which is why we have one of the highest um, people are leaving the state, you know, because they can't afford they can't afford to live here. And so, if we could do programs like consider tying Rutgers into like STEM research and business, and so if we could do a forgiveness, for example, for college loans, if kids graduate, get into business here, and invest in grow our economy, we can come up with resolutions that makes sense for all of us, that are workable on both sides. It's not, you know, in a divorce, people look at that as a win or lose, and they say, throw the cookies on the table and just start grabbing and collaborate. Politics is a lot like that. Well, so that's why I was trying to get the analogy so, in there. Is that so collaborative divorce starts, starts with common goals, values, and interests, and we construct winning wins using creative ideas and using the brain power in the room. So you don't, you know, just because you might have a different idea from me doesn't mean that I throw your ideas out of the place, right? I want you to bring your ideas to the table and have a conversation. So Republicans and Democrats should be sitting down and having hard discussions about what is our common goal and how can we best achieve this and then discuss how to make that happen. Now, you were talking before, in your legislative district, the 16th, yeah. We have, a, we have a district that is overburdened, according to a recent Harvard 2017 housing study, for renters and for homeowners, they're overburdened, spending between anywhere between 40 and 60% of their income to keep a roof over their heads. Where the, 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 now are you talking about property taxes or are you talking about rentals? Home ownership or renting. Yeah, most in, in, within the Edison, uh, South Brunswick, Princeton. But we're spending between, you know, on average, between 50 and 60 percent of our income, where they say that we should be spending between 25 and 30. And, and how does this, do you think, tie into? What, first of all, what can we do as a state to address that situation? And secondly, how can we balance that with what's coming to the affordable housing? Uh, the judges have been going down to different towns, setting amounts of affordable housing. But of course, that's not the only units that will get built. Developers have to build fair market units to build up for the affordable units. So it comes out to about a five to one. In the case of South Brunswick Township, we're looking at possibly adding another, 
I don't know, 10,000 people to the town in the next 10 years based on what Judge Wolfson has already ordered. With the schools and the roads and the hospitals and all the stuff that comes with that, right? So it's a kind of how do you raise the, how do you raise the water so all those rise, right? So it is, it is about investing in, um, in fuel alternatives and we can be doing that here. We could be, you know, as I think even Phil Murphy cited this, we could be the Silicon Valley of like renewable fuel sources. We used to be an innovative state and we have wonderful higher education institutions. So if we can grow the economy, which has been flat for a while, um, and we can keep, keep people here living and working here in the state instead of you know, having to go, they go to quality um, education out of the urban school, maybe they go to Rutgers, they go to Princeton, and then they get hired in Ohio, right? Um, Where, by the way, for the same salary, they can live like a king as opposed to just scrape right. by at about 40000 a year. Right, right. So it is looking at how are we spending money and how are, how are the dollars being spent. I just heard recently that they're going to repave, I believe it's five miles of Route 95, and the estimated cost is a little under $5 million a mile. And if you can compare what New York spends to repave roads, so it's a, it's a comparison. Why are we not looking at other states who are quote unquote doing it right? Why are our are, are our contracts? Um, what's going on? Is it a million a mile? Is it two million a mile? Is it five million a mile? And why? Nobody's been able to really <laughs> nail down a real specific number on that. You hear depending on your source, you know, right. a bunch of different. Things. So I think that's part of the issue too, is finding out what are other states that are doing right. California certainly turned themselves around as a state. I mean, they were heading towards bankruptcy, and they're nowhere near that now. And a lot of it was renewable fuel sources, reduction in water use. Um, so we have to get innovative. We have to be forward thinking, but we have to think about how can we pay for things now so we're not burdening future generations because that's not the way to do it. Either. What else would like the voters to know between oh, this campaign between now and uh, November? To vote for me. <laughs> I'd like them to know to vote for me because um, this is an important election. The nation is looking to see what the Democrats are going to do. And it's going to, it's going to um, inform elections in other, all the other states next year. The special elections where we didn't get a Democrat in is kind of informative. New Jersey needs to do its job. Virginia needs to do its job. But if we can turn LD16 blue, then we can give, we can give hope to other states who are fighting the same fight. Because I think the Trump wagon has to stop. And it starts, it starts local and it's up to the top. And we need to send a strong message. But, but the Democrats, and, and it's not just me saying this, this is sure. all across media. What is the message of the Democrats except we're not Trump and that we're not Trump message from before the presidential election is not working? The Democrats have lost a thousand seats in Congress and legislators and state houses. So it's not working. So when I was in law school, they used to give us cases and they would say argue one side or the other and suddenly you would be arguing to win your point so much that you would, I, I could remember standing there going, where am I going with this? I'm so far into winning, wanting to win my argument, I'm saying things that I don't even believe in anymore. And I almost think, I almost think that at the national level, at the federal level, our Democrats and Republicans have been so busy trying to win the argument, they've lost sight of what they really stand for. And I think that's a lot of come out of, that, out of the presidential election, is people stood up and said, you're not representing me, I'm not being heard. So I think they would have done anything to get rid of the status quo, as long as it wasn't a, um, a big, Family, a Clinton, a Bush, a, you know, somebody who's been in office, or a dynasty. And I think that that's what that meant. But I think we need to go back to our state level. And Roy is a non career politician. Um, I'm not a career politician. Uh, Andrew certainly isn't a career politician. We have a physicist, a retired businessman. Like I said, I'm a therapist and, and an attorney and a single mom. They're married to teachers. So we're in this because we care very deeply and the status quo has to change. Thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you.